What's up, you beautiful people? We are back for our next installment on preaching through the book of John. We are actually going to be finishing up John chapter 5 today. Uh, very excited about being able to preach for you and uh, having the privilege of opening God's word with you. So let's go to the Lord and pray, and we're just going to jump right into it. God, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much that you give it to us. God, lead us uh, in your word that we may understand it, illumine our hearts to the truths uh, that we need to hear, the challenges that we need to receive, uh, and the changes that we need to make. God, thank you so much that you are, are amazing to us, uh, that you have protected us, that you have walked with us. And God, no matter where we are in our life, we know that you are always going to take care of us. Uh, we just thank you for that love, and we thank you for your son, Jesus. Uh, we thank you for his cross and his resurrection. Uh, we thank you that he is one day coming again. Uh, so God, please uh, lead us in this in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to be in John chapter 5, verses 17 through 47. And before you freak out, yes, that is a lot of text, but uh, we've brought it back. We have brought it down to size so that we can understand uh, a main theme that is going through this passage. And the thing we want to talk about, uh, the thing we want to talk about today is honoring Christ and uh, defeating the power of unbelief in our own hearts. Uh, the reason why we, we're going through this today is because uh, we have uh, in, in the text, we're going to see that Jesus is going to come up against some opposition uh, from some religious leaders uh, and, and, and zealously religious people who want to uh, uh, who want to make God into uh, the big fairy in the sky um, and that um, he is there kind of to do their bidding rather than them to do his bidding. And they probably wouldn't have put it that way, but that in reality, that's really what's going on here because what we have is the power of unbelief that has been born in the hearts of these people. And so when we read, uh, it, starting in John, uh, I'm going to start actually in John uh, 5.15. We're going to end off uh, with, uh, kind of start up where we ended off last week uh, with the man who was uh, paralyzed uh, for 38 years and Jesus heals him. But rather than the man responding in belief, uh, the man runs away and tells the religious leaders uh, that uh, it was Jesus who did it so that Jesus would get in trouble and he wouldn't. Uh, so, uh, starting in verse 15, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed them. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making him equal with God. So what we have starting off here, guys, is a uh, is a the power of unbelief in in their hearts. And guys, that same power of unbelief is in our hearts. Now, the power we're talking about here uh, for unbelief is uh, it, it's not an atheistic way of believing, okay? So it's not people saying God doesn't exist or it, or an agnostic way of believing where saying that, well, maybe there is God, maybe there isn't God. The reality is that uh, it, it's really talking about uh, unbelief is talking about when we try to take God's word and God's purpose, God's plan and God himself and, and twist them or pervert them into our own image or our own desires. So the power of unbelief uh, in our hearts and in their hearts, uh, beginning with this, is uh, the problem with it is it twists God's plan. So when we look at what happened with the man, he runs back instead of God's plan of him repenting. Uh, God's plan of him being transformed from the heart, from the inside out, and and becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, and and um, and showing the rest of the world that this is what Jesus does for you. Instead, what we have is he runs to find to get the glory and the platitudes of men, and so he finds these religious leaders. Uh, now, when the Bible talks about the Jews, it's not talking about the Jews as a people, because Jesus was a Jew. Uh, you know, the disciples were Jews, so the first, uh, pretty much all the first Christians were Jews. So we're not talking about it in a some kind of racist, weird way. But what we're talking about is the religious, uh, the the religious form. All right, these zealously religious people who think that they figured out how to make God do what they want, when in reality, what they're doing is they're they're just piling up judgment for themselves. 
And guys, this is what unbelief does. It makes us think that we're in the right when we're not. All right. So this unbelief is just a bold refusal to believe in God as he is rather than God as we are. Uh, it's a refusal to believe in God as, as, as he is. And rather we want uh, to cr uh, push him into God as we want him. All right. The, these religious leaders, these zealous Jews, um, they weren't bad people. If we met them, guys, we would probably like them. If we sat and had conversation, we would have dinner with them. We'd have them in our homes. We'd raise our kids with them. They were moral people. They were good people. All right. So when we read them and even you can even see this in the uh, if, if you've ever listened to the Bible on tape or uh, uh, yeah, I'm dating myself there. If you've ever uh, listened to the audio versions of Bibles. All right when they do it dramatically, how do they usually make the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the high priests, uh, and, uh, the characteristic Jews sound, they give them kind of this edgier tone. They, they make them sound villainous. Um, when, uh, and, and yes, uh, that is in their hearts, but guys, when we stop and think we, we kind of want to separate them from ourselves because we want to believe we're the good guys. When in reality, we're kind of in the same boat as them. In a lot of ways, we follow the same kind of directives that they did. They were just a little bit more vocal about it. We don't, we don't ever say it the way they did. But when we're trying uh, to, uh, to make God uh, fit into our program, when we're trying to make God fit our pattern, we're being just like them, okay? Uh, so that's unbelief. And that's what it does to us. It, 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 it perverts and it changes things, all right? Um, these, they were just, uh, they, these are the people though, uh, they were fighting for their way of life. All right. But they were twisting God's plan because God didn't want them going after Jesus the way that he was, but he used it so that he could fulfill his ultimate plan of salvation for, uh, for mankind. All right. So, excuse me. Um, Jesus continues in verse 19. This is where Jesus picks up and starts talking. It says, truly, truly, and I'm going to stop right there. Whenever you're in the book of John, uh, especially the book of John, you might see it in, um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but especially in the book of John, when you see the word uh, or the phrase truly, truly, or verily, verily, or amen, amen, uh, depends on which version of the Bible you, uh, you're using, whether it's a King James or it's NIV or it's... Uh, English Standard Version, or it's uh, New American Standard. Um, truly, truly, I say it, it means listen. He's about to say something very important, okay? So whenever you see truly, truly, verily, verily, amen, amen, um, it means listen up. I'm about to say something profound. So Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all uh, that he himself is doing. Greater works than these uh, will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as the, they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, you, do you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing of my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is one who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, he has borne witness to truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say things, these things, so that you may be saved." He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. 
For the works that the Father has given to me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me because uh, so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I've come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus right away is jumping in and hitting at the heart of the matter, which he always does with people, okay? When when we go back, um, starting in... Um, uh, we're going to start in John 3 because uh, this is really where he picks up with his uh, his personal ministry and whatnot um, uh, after the uh, the changing water into wine. Uh, he goes right to the heart of Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus has an unbelief problem because Nicodemus has, uh, has been thinking uh, that it was all about his works. And Jesus is saying, no, it's all about the work that the Son of God will do for you. And so Nicodemus doesn't uh, has a hard time, but he ends up believing. He goes right to the heart of the matter. The woman at the well, the heart of the matter with her was that she was an adulteress and that she was con consistently and constantly looking for uh, justification through the next man she would be with. And so Jesus goes to the heart of the matter with her and also the heart of the matter with the Samaritan saying, hey, you guys are making this about places when you need to be making it about God. All right. Uh, and then we go on to the official son, uh, the man who was uh, uh, the man who has uh, a son who is uh, uh, he just needs to be healed. And he wants Jesus to come and heal him. And Jesus goes to the heart of the matter again, starts talking about you want to see signs and wonders. Well, I'm not going to do a crazy sign and wonder going with you. I'm just going to tell you and you got to believe me. All right. Unbelief again. All right. Then we go to the man, uh, kind of the culmination almost uh, story uh, where we're dealing with this uh, this this man uh, who's been paralyzed for 38 years. You'd think that when Jesus offers uh, healing, this man would be overjoyed, but he's not. He He's just basically saying, well, I've got to get to the pool and I can't make it. And Jesus like Jesus asking him simple questions, but he can't answer those simple questions. So here's the deal, guys. Um, when we're dealing with unbelief. It 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 twists God's plan. And so Jesus is going to the heart of the matter. Why are they twisting God's plan? Because they pervert God's word. So um, how can those of uh, who follow God's word go wrong? Uh, it's because they use it as an end unto itself. The Bible was never meant to be uh, the, sole, the sole way. Um, uh, the, it wasn't meant to be our sole focus. God is our sole focus. The Bible points us to God in a relationship with God, meaning that you just reading the Bible is not going to do it for you. You need to engage with God. You have to engage with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? Unbelief disciples our hearts by convincing us we are following the letter of the law, i.e. we're doing all these good works and we're getting it right, um, and that God should commend us for that, all right? Unbelief leads us to believe that we're doing okay, that we're uh, that we're in God's good graces. But the reality is, it misses the whole point of God. All right, the Bible becomes an idol to be uh, accomplished in our own power, apart from faith in God's power. All right, so we become our own savior. We we turn the Bible into a how-to manual rather than realizing it's pointing to Jesus. All right. Uh, That's my little picture of Jesus back there. All right. So when we talk about perverting God's word, it means you can be doing all of the right things technically, but still breaking the very spirit of the law. All right. The, still breaking the very spirit of what God intended. So what we want to do is come back to God's main point. And um, when we make the Bible into an idol, we do miss God's main point. All right. 
God's word points us to our need for a savior, all right? We need Jesus, the son of God, to die for our sin, his blood to be shed for us so that um, so that we can have right standing with God. We can never work our way into God's good favor, all right? Unbelief pushes us away from the love of God and into competition with God. This is why Jesus says this, um, that uh, they, you are, uh, he tells the, these, these religious people um, that uh, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God in verse 44. Jesus is saying, you guys are so busy competing with God for his glory. You guys are so busy um, trying to one up one another and trying to be the best rather than together pushing one another toward God. All right. Rather than uh, desiring a, a personal relationship with God. And here's the deal. If we are competing with God for his glory, we can't be in his love. We can't be receiving his love because we're pushing his love away, still trying to get his glory, all right? And all this does, when we look in verse 29, jump back up here to, to verse 20, uh, 29, all right? Um, when he, uh, 20 and 29, he says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, it's interesting here when we're talking about good versus evil, because you would think that these people are all doing good works, so they would be fine. But Jesus is saying they're in the bad camp. They're the people who are, who are uh, doing evil. Why? Because they're perverting God's word. Because they're missing the main point. And because they're twisting God's plan, it's not about them. It's about Christ. It's about God. It's about making much of him. Stephen Curtis Chapman uh, wrote, uh, uh, did an album called All Things New, uh, did a fantastic song called Make Much of You. Uh, and the, the whole point of the song is to say, he, he, it's his prayer saying, I want to make much of you, Jesus. Uh, I want to make much of your cross. I want to make much of your resurrection. I want to make much of your ascension. I want to make much about everything about you, Jesus. All right. So, uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic album. Might not be for some of you. It's a, it's a little bit older, um, but uh, some of you might love it. Um, I'm not calling you old. I'm just saying some of you might like that kind of version, that that kind of music. All right. I knew what some of you were thinking. That was mean. Don't think that. All right. All right. So, um, what do we do about this? Okay, what is Jesus? How is Jesus pushing us in the right direction? All right, so the direction that Jesus is actually pushing us toward is the greater power of believing, believing and honoring Jesus. All right, so uh, Jesus, uh, look back at some of the, the things he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, starting in verse 19, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you will marvel. For as the father raises the, uh, the dead and uh, gives life to them, so also the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but gives all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son, just as the, the, they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Okay. Um, he does not come into judgment, but has passed out of, uh, passed from death to life. See, that's what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about the resurrection, some to judgment and some to, uh, some to eternal life. Here's the beauty of this saying that when we, when we, when we go from unbelief, all right, and we're saying unbelief, uh, is the bold refusal to believe in God as he is. All right. Um, so we want to, uh, we want to change that into a bold alignment with God as he is. All right. We don't want God as we want him. Okay. Because that would be a faulty God. That would be a God that is so, uh, so messed up. You think about all of the different ways you've wanted God to come into alignment with your life. Okay. With your choices, with your desires, but yet you find out that all of those desires, all of those choices were just not that great. All right. What if God had uh, upheld them? What if God had said, Hey, I'm going to make this all about you. Okay. We'd have a really messed up world because, um, my will is going to be different than pastor Jordan's will. His will is going to be different from Rachel's will. Rachel's will is going to be different from Caleb's will. So we have, 
all of these, we'd have all these disparate wills and God would be upholding all of them. That'd be craziness. All right. And it wouldn't work. It would, it would say that he's not God and that we are. And God is not uh, people-centric. He's God-centric. He's centered on himself because he alone is the highest and he alone deserves praise, okay? So when we, when we turn the power of unbelief into the power of belief and honoring Jesus, we come into alignment with God's will and his word. So when we look at verses uh, 37 through 47 again, all right, it's it's to say that um, uh, if we want to be in alignment with Jesus, we had we actually have to say uh, that it's it's about Him and not about us. Okay, F the Father, the uh, God, the Father made this about Jesus and focusing the glory on Him. All right, so He wants us to do the same thing. Um, Shane and Shane uh, are is a, a Christian uh, recording uh, group. Um, they were doing, uh, back in, I think, about 2002, uh, they did, uh, 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 they were part of Passion, Sacred Revolution, and uh, they did a version of um, a song that I have just completely forgotten. Isn't this great? It's record. I'm just recording this, not live, but I still don't remember this song. It is well with my soul. I knew if I bantered long enough, I'd get it. Um, and he prays this prayer, Father, uh, we want your heart for Jesus. Um, we want you to, to pour into us the love that you have for Jesus so that we can love Jesus the way you do. That's the whole point that Jesus is making here. He wants us to love him the way the Father loves him. And he wants us to love the Father the way he loves the Father. That's, that's our purpose. That's how we come into alignment. We, we follow who he is, all right? We don't see the word of God as the ultimate thing we need, all right? Ultimately, I don't need the Bible. Ultimately, I need salvation through Christ. The Bible points me toward that. The Bible is God's word. It is important, all right? So don't do away with it. Don't ever hear me saying that. But what I'm saying is don't make it an end unto itself. If you're studying the Bible as a way to get into God's good graces, you've missed the point. What it's talking about is Use the Bible as a way, as a pointer to Jesus to have a better relationship with him, to have a, a lasting relationship with him, okay? So that's firstly what it does. Secondly, all right, it, Jesus is calling us and challenging us uh, to a life of repentance, all right? Look at 19 and 20 again, okay? Look at 19 and 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only that what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all things uh, that he himself is doing. And greater things uh, than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Now, Jesus goes on to say some things here, but um, here's the deal. Jesus sees his life as a fulfillment, uh, his life's purpose to fulfill the will of the Father. Guys, Jesus fulfilled the will of the Father so that we also might fulfill the will of the Father. This is not a moralistic tale, okay? I'm not telling you, well, because Jesus did it, you ought to too. What I'm saying is you, we were unable to fulfill the will of the Father outside of Jesus, okay? So your good works up until the, the moment you came into faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, up until he brought you out of death into life, were garbage, okay? Um, you being moral, you being, uh, per, uh, you know, right in your own eyes, you doing all those good works, feeding the homeless, housing, uh, or, uh, housing the homeless, feeding the hungry, giving thirsty people water, all right, loving your enemy, all that kind of stuff. Isaiah says that they are as dirty rags. So what Jesus is saying is that true faith in him will bring us to repentance, all right? And that repentance is all about us going off of ourselves and onto him. So he calls us to repent of being the God over our own lives, all right? Excuse me, and focusing on the true God of our lives. He calls us to repent of working to gain his approval. We can't work to gain his approval. The only way we can gain his approval is by having faith, by, by receiving the grace of God, uh, ha placing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and following him in that faith, all right? And once that happens, he calls us to repentance based in love, not fear. Tim Keller says this. I love this. I love this quote. It's one of my favorites from him. Fear-based repentance makes us hate ourselves. 
Joy-based repentance makes us hate the sin. Now, why is that important? Because fear, uh, this is the reason why God is not trying to scare you into salvation. All right. He's doing, he draws you in through grace and through mercy and through love. Why? Because if it's based in fear, we're always focused on ourselves. We're always focused on what do I have to do next? What do I have to do next? When in reality, he doesn't want you focused on what you have to do next. He wants you focused on following Jesus. All right. And I realize it, it sounds like that's what I'm doing next. But the reality is he wants the focus on Jesus. All right. Hebrews 12 uh uh, verse two says, let us focus our attention on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God. He wants us focused on Jesus, not on our sin, not on uh, our um, on how bad we are, because when we're focused on ourselves, that's called narcissism. All right. So we want to focus on him and we want to repent of all of those times that we are focusing on ourselves and on our sin rather than on Christ. Because if we're so focused on Christ, we're not focused on our sin. And it leads us through and it leads us in an active life of repentance. All right. From sin, from thinking that we're God, from trying to gain God's approval, from thinking that we can work our way into God's good graces because we can't. All right. Thirdly, all right. We become witnesses of God's grace in Jesus Christ. Jesus in 19, or, or sorry, in verses uh, 30 through 47, the whole point of those verses is Jesus saying, these are all the people and things that witness that I am the Christ, okay? These are all the things that Jesus is saying that you need to know, that you need to hear so and see, all right? So, um, and uh, what, what Jesus is saying in about this is that we become witnesses of God's grace in Jesus Christ. We're going to join a great cloud of witnesses um, that testify about Jesus. But firstly, um, uh, Jesus brings us, uh, it, and I've, I've already been kind of referencing this already, but we are brought out of death into life, all right? Verses 24 through 29 uh, uh, tell us truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who, uh, here will live for as the father has himself, uh, so he uh, has life in himself. So he himself has granted the son to uh, have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out and those who have uh, done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. All right. So Jesus brings us out of death. What does that mean? He brings us away from God's wrath. He brings us away from God's ultimate uh, uh, penalty judgment. All right. We're all going to we're all going to face the judgment of God. But the reality is what the judgment that Jesus is talking about here is the judgment that does not have Jesus as our advocate, the judgment that doesn't have Jesus blood covering us so that our sin has already been paid for. OK, um, and guys, if you're hearing this message today, if, if you do, if you do not have Jesus as your savior, today is the day to cry out and ask him to transform your life, to ask him to change you, um, uh, from the person who is under God's wrath, which will lead to judgment in the final place of, uh, hell in the lake of fire. All right. Which is an eternal judgment. It's eternal penalty. It's a place where, um, uh, torment does not end. It's where the wrath of God is poured out on the unbeliever for eternity. All right. It is, it is awful. I do not wish it on anyone. I don't care how bad they've been in, in, in history. I don't wish it on Osama. I didn't wish it on Osama bin Laden. Don't wish it on uh, Adolf Hitler wishing that all of those guys had come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so that they could know forgiveness so that they, they would not be receiving the, the full penalty for their sin. But guys, those who are outside of Jesus, that is what happens. They receive that full penalty and it is a wrath you do not want to bear. So what, when we, Jesus says he's brought us out, he calls us out of death into life. This is what he's talking about, that we did, we're not going to endure the, the wrath of God the way Jesus did on the cross because he already did it for us. All right. So, uh, Jesus, uh, is calling us out of death. And then, uh, at that point he was preparing his followers, uh, for his death and resurrection. He was preparing them 
uh, for the fact that he was going to die and that he was going to be raised from the dead and that he is going to do this for them as well, all right? But he also points us to the power of his death and resurrection for our daily lives. Means, guys, we need Jesus just as much today as we did the day we got saved, all right? And if this is the day of your salvation, praise God. If this, if this is uh, number 1,050 for you, praise God. But you need Jesus every single day, not just for salvation, but for uh, living a life that is in accord with, uh, with belief in him and honoring him. So that means looking to Jesus to clean up your language, not as a moralistic way of it, but in love for him. All right. It turns it from my duty to my desire. Okay. Let, let, let's, let's, let's change those two things. Duty is I have to do it. Desire is I want to do it. I want to change my language. I want to change my internet habits. I want to treat people better. Why? Not because uh, it, it's just making me a better person, but because it loves Jesus. Because it shows him that I love him. It shows him that he has had a profound impact on my life and that uh, and it shows that uh, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, um, oh, that those are actual real things in my life and that uh, I, I am being used in that way, all right? It points us, and there is power in that gospel, guys. Every time somebody comes to me for counseling, anytime somebody comes to me and asks me, how do I do it? I, I say, go back to the gospel. Go back to what Christ did on the cross. Go back to his resurrection. That resurrection power that is in Jesus is also in every single believer. How do I know this? Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 to 23 talks about the power that is being displayed toward us that Paul is praying that we would understand that power. It's the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of God. And guys, that's a lot of power. It is at your disposal. It, it is there for you, okay? Every single believer, not so that we can do whatever we want, but so that we can glorify God, so that we can be the people of God's heart. And this turns us into, and we it makes us into part of the cloud of witnesses, as John testifies, as Nicodemus testified, as the woman at the well testified, as the official and his whole family from Capernaum rec uh, testify. We are now testimonies of grace. Guys, we honor the Son through testifying about His love to others who don't have the Savior. That means it is our responsibility to tell people about Jesus. It's not our it's not our responsibility to change them, but it is our responsibility to tell them. But it's also our we honor the uh, it's also our responsibility um, to honor the Son through submitting to His authority. All right, we can't do anything of our own power. A lot of you know this. You've tried to transform yourself, and it hasn't worked. You're still in the middle of things. You're just, it's so been so difficult for you, but it's because you're still fighting God's authority. Stop fighting his authority, submit to his authority and watch him overcome your issues. He may not take you out of your circumstance or your situation, but he definitely will change your attitude and definitely will change your outlook on that situation and see it as an opportunity to glorify God and to show others this great savior that has changed your life. Guys, uh, I'm going to end with this. In Revelation chapter 12, um, Michael uh, and, his, uh, and his angels are fighting against Satan and his minions. And Michael overcomes them. He overwhelms them. And he takes Satan and he throws him to the earth. And then an angel cries, whoa, woe to the earth because the serpent is now down there. And the serpent turns his attention to the saints of God and he starts to attack him attack them. But uh, the angel says, but the saints overcome the dragon by two things. I want you to hear this. Two things. The blood of the lamb, he pays for your sin. He, he, he did everything uh, that you couldn't. And the word of their testimony. It means your story is powerful, but it's only powerful because Jesus is part of it. So use that story to tell other people about Jesus. Don't try to tell people things you don't know. Don't try to tell people things you don't understand. Rather, tell people the things you do know, the things you do understand. The other stuff, um, you, you can point them to your pastor. Pastor Jordan is very knowledgeable, very loving, and loves to tell people about Jesus. So uh, uh, at your elders, um, 
They also uh, just just loving uh, to talk to people about Jesus. I know sometimes they feel intimidated, but uh, they are great witnesses for the Lord. And uh, you know, use them. They are uh, they are a tool God has given you. All right. Um, go back to the scriptures. All right. Go back to the scriptures and and show people how the scriptures point to Jesus. All right. Um, and then look at your own life because God has made you a testimony of grace. Guys, I love you. I hope you have a wonderful week. Let's pray, and we're just going to end. God, we just thank you so much for your word. Uh, take it and plant it in our hearts. Uh, use us this week uh, to really transform us. Uh, use us this week uh, to uh, to transform other people uh, with your, your message of grace and hope and goodness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You guys have a wonderful week.